my own unnatural porter and set my beasties there and it can have whatever flavor I want. A modern conspiracy of alchemists is set in an alternate Europe. It starts in Paris in 1903, but it's not the Paris we would, rec we would recognize. Talk a little bit. All right, we're going to go, most of you have just discussed research, whether it's your research or the help of fans and readers and people who love your work. What is the weirdest piece of research you've come up with as you're working on these? I did a whole um, piece on um, how to shrink kids, <laughs> <laughs> which I never ended up using, but I gave it to Dickie Peterson. You did indeed. She put it in the books. Yeah. Right, so that was a lot of fun finding out how you the right way to peel the uh, skin off the skull and then scrape out the fat from the inside of the, uh, of the face. You gotta do it right. <laughs> so. You win. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my third Dan Shamble book starts out with an illegal, instead of illegal cockfighting ring, it's a cockatrice fighting ring. <laughs> um, and so I had to research cockatrices, which was not that hard. Um, but I had to research cockfighting too, and you have to figure out how do you how do you install the gaff onto the feet of a cockatrice when you can't look at them because they'll turn you to stone and they want to bite your head off. And, and um, that was research. <laughs> My, I, I did some research about whether ghouls were technically you know alive or undead or some other sort of state of existence. This mattered because my druid magic cannot affect living things. So I was going back into uh, quite a bit of, you know, ancient ghoul mythology to try to figure out, you know, in, in the oldest stories, were they living or dead or something, you know, in between. And uh, I didn't actually, it, it was a great, you know, fun day for me and I didn't realize how bizarre it was until my wife came home. And she is uh, an English teacher and of course, you know, she's dealing with, you know, high school kids all day. Uh, you know, it could be challenging. So uh, she goes through her day and what she had to deal with. She broke up a fight and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, what did you do today? And then I told her, and she's like, you are kidding me. <laughs> Seriously, this is your life now? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think the weirdest thing I ever found out uh, was when I started re I started doing st uh, uh, looking at statistics uh, uh, on the FBI homepage uh, uh, for 
for, for missing for missing persons. And uh, uh, and I was watching uh, I've been watching something on Animal Planet at about the same time. And uh, uh, I realized as I was watching it that the statistics for missing persons in the United States uh, uh, are by by the numbers. Uh, almost exactly the same as the statistics for animals that get eaten on the African savanna. <laughs> uh, about one in thirty. It's about one in thirty thousand that gets taken down by a predator, and that's about how many people go missing. Um, and, uh, which is one of those disturbingly true things. <laughs> when you dig into it, I mean, you find out that it's not quite that bad, but it's still kind of bad. Like if you had a if you had a graduating cr class of at least a couple hundred people, somebody in your class has gone missing. It's just Vanished, uh, uh, which is sort of one of those spooky things to realize. It's like, oh, that's where we live. Uh, welcome to the jungle. <laughs> 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 so, a little bit more maybe prosaic than some of these. I, my second book is set in a city in the desert where you know they used to sacrifice to the gods to make it rain, so you could have crops grow and everything. And the um, they then had a revolution against the gods. A bunch of them were killed, and the rest were kicked out. And now you're stuck in a desert city, and there's no rain. So what do you do? So I did an immense amount of research on the Central Valley Project and the uh, sort of California water wars in the early 20th century, and just the sheer amount of stuff that went on there with the, um, the purchasing of land rights, so sort of out from under people, and the second-level shell corporations, and all of that. I don't know, that's the kind of thing that gets me really interested. <laughs> so my librarians always like give me a hard time because I'll go in and they'll be like, oh, a book on morgues. Oh, a book on poison. Oh. <laughs> you know, all the other patrons are inching away from me as my my big checkout. So I think for um, Nick Fortuna, mostly just like um, morgues, I've actually never been in a morgue. And so I had to research what it really looked like and what they really do. And I'll you spent your whole life and never once going to a morgue. Wasn't hanging out with the wrong people. Those people only go in once. <laughs> it's stuck with you forever, so you're welcome. This is 
why I love asking that question. <laughs> they always have the we could go on. Do you guys want to go on about that, or should we talk about other stuff? Yeah. Other stuff. Okay, we got, we got a mix here. Um, so one thing I want to talk about, and this is for several of the authors, but we've got a question from several of the other of authors. Um, Kevin, Richard, and Jim, you all have very interesting sidekicks. One is a hound named Oberon. One is a disembodied head, and the other is sort of a talking skull. What happens when the sidekicks are almost as exciting and interesting as the heroes, and how do you keep them as sidekicks? Jim? Uh, well, for, for me, I stuck him in a skull. <laughs> <laughs> it really sort of limits how much you can participate. You know, um, uh, when I was creating him, uh, one of the one of the thing one of the things you learn uh, as a writer, and, and I, I've heard it about a dozen different ways. The way it was taught to me was uh, the principle of the joy of idiocy is what it's called, and it's the idea that when you're writing, you always keep a dummy around to ask questions so that you can answer the questions without slowing down the story too much. Uh, uh, and so one of the things that I wanted to do is, is occasionally, you're, a lot most of the time, Harry is the one answering the idiot's questions, uh, but some of the time I wanted Harry to be the idiot. And so he would need an advisor, so I created Bob for that. Uh, but I, but if, if, if Bob was the one who could go out and do things, he could not be, you know, uh, he was going to be taking over the story, uh, which I didn't want to happen. Uh, so I kind of stuck him in the skull. Uh, all right, you're stuck there, you can't go there, you can't go do anything. You can be smart uh, and help, uh, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, Holmes, you might be the one who's solving the crime, but Watson's the one who carries the gun. <laughs> <laughs> And that's why Holmes and Watson work. Uh, it's one of the reasons it works. But anyway, uh, that's kind of what I did to, to limit that. Uh, well, I get some requests sometimes uh, for you know, Oberon to have his own stories and things like that. And uh, it, it's, it's difficult to have a story just about a dog who really doesn't have any superpowers other than the fact that he can talk to one guy. <laughs> uh, so he, he's, he's simply a dog, and the conflict would be Atticus, I'm hungry. Okay, here's some food. All right, that was, that was quick. I, I got that story. Uh, so, uh, I, I, he does have a purpose besides just comic relief, though. I mean, the, the serious purpose for Oberon is to keep Atticus grounded in the present because that's where dogs live. They don't live in the past, and they, if, if they're thinking about the future, it's only what they will get to eat in the future. So, uh, it, it's, it's something that takes a, a person who's you know, vastly old like Atticus and keeps him in the now rather than dwelling in the past and perhaps not worrying so much about his future. So that's why he values uh, animal companions because most animals are like that. Um, in my books I have, uh, yeah, the disembodied head is this um, guy named Kasabian where that um, my hero, James Stark, cut his head off and got rid of his body. And uh, Kasabian, the whole idea was sort of um, in two parts. One, um, he's just kind of a Shakespearean fool, because, I mean, Stark has a lot of, uh, he has anger and self-pity issues sometimes, and I sort of needed someone to, who could just always say the truth to him, to always just say, shut up, because Kasabian, at this point, being ahead, has nothing to lose. And um, the other thing was, I, I wanted this... I, I always saw them as the odd couple. I always saw them as Felix and Oscar, this kind of uh, little bickering couple that are thrown together through weird circumstances and kind of, uh, as much as they at times dislike each other, can't exist without the other one. We've got several people here where science versus magic is a large part of the book. Um, Liesl, you actually have a, a rivalry between alchemists and warlocks. Max, you've got sort of both sides of the philosophical, and you've got what was interesting is the legal procedures, which almost become sort of the counterpart to the magic. There's sort of the magic, and then there's the very codified sort of legal process they're going through. Um, so why don't you guys talk about that a little bit? wanted a sort of a, a magical feel to it as well. And it, it seemed just like a natural thing to do, to sort of split the world into the realms of shadow and light. 
um, life be in the world of science and technology and you know, steam-powered machines and you know, all that kind of thing. Um, and, and then having the sort of slightly more organic, um, magical side of, of, of the book um, uh, take place in a sort of alternate realm. And the two are sort of um, split right down the middle by, and, and held apart by a barrier. Um, and obviously my, my main character, Eleanor Chance, is, is the oracle in the story and um, she is integral uh, to this whole setup. And uh, yeah, it just felt like a natural thing to do because, um, you know, st the steampunk elements of machinery and all that sort of stuff seem more scientific and, and so on. Although uh, the steampunk elements sort of operate because of the magic that's around in the world. So it just kind of fitted together for me and it just felt natural to do it that way. So when I started writing Three Parts Dead, uh, my wife, and it was my girlfriend at the time, had just started going to law school. And I paid pretty close attention to what she was doing, and law school turned out to be this place where you had people walking around wearing robes and reading thick, thick red leather books that were like all on their shelves, and where you'd get these sort of professors with wrinkles on their faces who are sort of stuttering about the classroom and then would disappear off to like Washington to talk to senators about secret things that they could only express in dead languages. <laughs> so the analogy seemed pretty clear to start off. And then I started thinking about it a little bit more even beyond the surface level and oh, there's a certain portion of law that's all about contracts and consideration about signing deals on dotted lines and blood ink and I think a lot of that anxiety about making a promise that you are going to be kept to by some powerful authority that's far beyond your control um, I think that is really old and snuck all the way into our myth and into our legends I feel like the two have had a lot more to do with one another than in Paris for a very long time and yeah, and then it's fun to get to make jokes about document review every once in a while. <laughs> uh, speaking of myths and legends, my own name yours, Nick Fortuna, is actually the son of one of the lesser known fates, Lady what? Luck. Lady Luck. What made you sort of work with the Greek and Roman mythology and work with fates? Well, um, so this is this is the thing. It's like a lot of I, I absolutely hate the saying "cream rises to the top." It makes me want to bark. It's like so entitled and like clueless. Like wherever you are at, it's it's a balance.